Welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Art. Um, gee, Bob, uh, I, you know what? I'm going to start at the end. Um, why do you hate talking about UFOs? <sighs> well, there's a few reasons. First, first of all, it's gotten pretty old. It's been, you know, over a decade. Yeah. And uh, second of all, uh, yeah, I'm... I'm glad I was involved in the project for a short time, but, um, you know, once you leave that and try and enter normal life, mm. especially if you're peddling your services mm. in research and development, in the scientific field, it becomes really tough for people to take you seriously when you're known as the UFO guy. <laughs> So same, it's just hard actually, to kind of divorce all that stuff. That's kind of the same problem that John Lear had, you know, when he was working for the airlines. Uh, it finally got to the point where he had to say no more. And for years, of course, he didn't talk at all. Right. I know he had a lot of problems with that. And, and uh, I don't know. That's something people just don't take into account. Got fired. Uh, actually got fired because of it from one airline. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's what I heard. Um, how, how do you now remember that special year with John, or maybe it was more than a year, but the time, period of time you spent with John and you went through all of that. How do you now remember that? Do you remember it fondly? Do you remember it as something you wish you hadn't done, or what? Oh, no. It's, those are fond memories. It was, uh, it was fun and exciting back then, uh, you know, before all the problems started and all the hassles from the feds and whatnot, but... Uh, yeah, back in the early days before all this became popular and Area 51 was on the tip of everybody's tongue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were sneaking around out there when there were minimal security and, and whatnot, and I had the uh, the test flight schedule at that time, so we knew exactly what was going to happen and what was going on. And Well, you know what I'd like to know? Why did you, I mean, you at that time had a pretty damn good, secure job uh, at an extremely secret place. What made you decide to grab John by the collar and say, hey, buddy, I can show you something? <laughs> I mean, wh wh how do you make that choice? Uh, hmm. <laughs> I have to place myself back in that time. Well, there, I, it's one of that, that's kind of a loaded question because there was a lot of stuff going on at that time. And, you know, I kind of make a long story short. At the time, they were just calling me out, um, usually at night, on specific days to go out there when I initially started working down at the test site. Right. And, you know, this was causing problems with my wife at the time because I, I was keeping everything confidential, even from her. Sure. And, you know, here at uh, 11 or 12 o'clock at night, I get this call and, and I, gotta I go. disappear. And, you know, and this happens time and time again. And Where are you going, honey? I'm sorry, I can't talk about that. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm going to work. I'm sure you are. Yeah. You know, and uh, as this goes on for quite a while, suspicions begin to build up. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of kept my friends at, at arm's length at that time because I just didn't want any problems. I wanted all the, you know, the, <laughs> this newfound security to go smoothly. Sure. And... Uh, was pretty much playing with the game. So it started causing suspicion in my friends and, you know, immediate family and that sort of thing. So I decided to take the risk one night and uh, just bring everybody out close enough to where they could see a test flight when I knew a test flight was going on. Yeah, but you, you had to know what you were risking, right? Oh, I did. And, you know, I can't... I can't really say what the actual motivation was back then, you know, specifically what made it, you know, what made me snap on that day, but... Uh, were you angry at them? Uh, were you showing... No, not at that point. Were you showing off? There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I mean, if that's what it was, that's what it was. I mean, I, I can understand. No, I, I, it really wasn't that, you know, and it, that, it, that would actually be an easy answer, but... Uh, it really wasn't that. If I recall, that we didn't start, we didn't start butting heads until after that. Right. But um, that was about it. I think it was to alleviate suspicion and show, you know, several of my friends what was going on. What was really going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
how much during those sojourns, how much did you actually get to see along with John? While we were out of the area or while I was actually working there in the area? Well, yeah, they're two separate things. No, I meant when you took John and others up there. What, how, how, is what you saw, uh, was it convincing for those who came along with you? There was no question in their mind about what they were seeing. Oh, no, there, there, there was no question. I mean, John hauled out his, even though we got much closer in than you can today, Near uh -huh. the area. Well, I have no idea what it's like today, but at least when I was last in Las Vegas a few years ago, you you really couldn't get very far out on the road. But we we drove in close to ten miles, and you can't do that anymore. But John hauled out his Celestron ten inch telescope, and from there it was quite a view. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you were seeing saucers, a saucer, yeah, a saucer. Mm -hmm. Um. Hovering, moving, doing... yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just lifted off the ground and hovered around. Do you have any idea? Now, of course, you actually—it's another story. But I mean, you, you of course got in to see the real McCoy. Um, you saw how many saucers ultimately at S four? Oh, there were nine total. Nine total. But awesome. it, you know, these were seen at a distance. The only one I actually had direct contact with was the one that was being test flown. Uh huh. Um, do you have any idea how they sufficiently back engineered whatever in the hell they found inside that saucer to be able to test fly it? Do you have any idea what went on to 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 learn about? I mean, there must have been. I mean, what was it like inside inside this thing? What was it like if you were standing there looking at it inside? What would you be seeing? Well, I guess the most shocking thing about it is it was. Everything was one color. There was no aesthetics at all. Everything was a light gray. And uh, it was as if, and I've said this before, it was as if the entire device was made out of, carved out of wax, heated for a bit, and cooled off. There were no sharp edges, no right angles. Everything was rounded and smooth, both inside and out. There are no seams or anything like that. It like, like it had a, been done by from a mold or something? Right, like a giant injection mold of some sort. But, um, so that's it. It's, yeah, I mean, that was probably the most obvious thing you'd notice when you walk in there. It just uh, didn't look conventional at all. <laughs> Any idea, again, I, I mean, from that, could you see, but... Uh, what, how did they navigate this thing? Were there buttons? Were there joysticks? Were there what sort of... I have no idea. No idea? No. And so you would have no idea then how they back-engineered. It would have to be a pretty dangerous thing to take a craft that you just had and uh, try to figure out how to fly the damn thing. I, I imagine so. And from the stories I've heard, that it, it was quite a dangerous thing. But unfortunately, a lot of this went on way before I ever got there. And uh, obviously, they had at least found out to some extent how some of the systems and subsystems operated. Mm -hmm. Do you know how they got their hands on these in the first place? I mean, how did they get them? I don't know. I don't know. Unfortunately, a lot of the information is compartmentalized, so nobody has, no one person has the whole story about everything. And that's typically done in any government project. Absolutely. So nobody can walk away with you know, the whole project or knowledge of everything. But, uh, yeah, I, I wish I had the complete picture sure. of what was going on. Even just smaller pieces to the picture I did have, I would be very interested in how the navigational system operated. That still kind of puzzles me, uh, as do flight controls and, and things of that sort. But And propulsion? This element, what is it, 116? 115, yeah. One, yeah, 115. Uh, element 115. Uh, do you have any concept of how the propulsion system did what it did? I know how a, you know, a jet plane moves from A to B and so forth and so on. I mean, how was this element 115 used to, to, to move the craft? What, what kind of propulsion system is it? It's a gravity propulsion system, something that's uh, <laughs> completely alien to us, if you don't mind me saying that. That's a good word, yeah. The, um, 
instead of an action-reaction system, I guess the, the analogy I always use is if you go put a bowling ball in the middle of your bed and three feet away from it, push your fist into the bed and push down really hard, the bowling ball rolls towards it. That's correct. And what happens in these craft, or in this particular one anyway, there were three gravity amplifiers in them. And what these are are long tubes that are in the belly of the craft. And they're on kind of a universal pivot type joint mm -hmm. uh, to make it simple. Uh, it's actually something more complicated than that, but what they can do is swing two of the emitters up at one time, focus on a point in front of the craft, and cause a local distortion. And essentially, the craft moves forward towards it, just like the bowling ball would. So it's, so it's, kind of the, it's falling into a path it's making for itself. Right. It's kind, it's kind of constantly rolling downhill, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, which is the opposite of how our vehicles travel. We always accelerate air, throw exhaust out the back, do something to propel something forward, and uh, in the air anyway. And this essentially operates the opposite. And now, is it dependent on a local field of gravity? In other words, obviously these ships are designed to fly uh, through interstellar space, and I wonder what the, if they're using gravity in that manner, then how does local gravity, I wonder, affect them? In other words, the Earth has um, gravity, and when they're within our field, is it any different than when they're in interstellar space in terms of the way it operates? Yeah, completely. There's two different modes of travel. There's Delta and Omicron. Oh? And the Omicron configuration is when the craft uses one of the emitters to essentially hover on and causes that local distortion with the other two in front of it. Right. Causing it to move forward. This is something I've never heard before. Okay. Oh, the delta configuration. In fact, there. let me take a step back for a second. That's how the craft is flown in an area of gravity. Now, when you want to leave a local area of gravity, say fly into space, what is done is you transition from Omicron to Delta. And in a lot of the uh, UFO pictures you see occasionally, uh, you'll see these UFOs at these ridiculous angles, at 45-degree angles hanging in the middle of the air. Sure. And uh, that the reason for that is that's the transition between the two, two different flight modes. Ah, as the craft lifts off the ground, it has to fly in a gravity-free environment in space with the belly forward. It doesn't fly like a flying saucer does in a science fiction movie. The emitters focus on one point, right. all three of them out in space, and that's how the, the thing travels. So you're kind of going from a conventional mode of flight, lifting up in the air, raising the belly, and then aiming that towards your target, and that's how you, you progress. Uh, Bob, knowing what you know about at least the propulsion system, um, what can you imagine that might go wrong and cause a craft to crash as it allegedly did, for example, at Roswell? You know, I've wondered about, <laughs> about that for a while, and I, can't, I really can't see how one of these things could, could crash. Um, but apparently it did. But I just, I can't see where a failure is going to typically occur. I don't care if there's a, a lightning storm or what locally is going on. Unless there was something that occurred within the craft, I don't think there's any external force that's going to act on it, certainly any natural force, and cause any problems. Because if you're generating your own gravi gravitational field, you're essentially immune to everything that's going on around you. Hmm. Um, if that field should fail for some reason? Well, yeah, if so, that's why I say if something, if some defect occurred inside or if something was done unintentionally uh, as far as piloting the craft, that I could see happening. But I, I don't buy the story somebody comes cruising in from 30 light years away, runs into a thunderstorm and crashes into the ground. Yeah, you bet. Uh, are you convinced that Roswell was, in fact, a crash of an alien craft? No. 
Oh, oh, really? Now, there's a surprise. Well, you used um, the word convinced. Um, the only, <laughs> uh, well, you I know, it's, there, There's a lot of information that leads me to believe that, but, you know, <laughs> I'm one of the most skeptical people when it comes to flying saucer stories. And I know that almost sounds hypocritical, but that's, that's just the way it is. Becoming involved with, you know, one aspect of it uh, kind of cemented that in my mind. But, you know, boy, there's lots of wacko stories out there, and, and I'm sure you've, you've heard your share of them, maybe I, more than anybody. Uh, perhaps I have. Um, but, but, you know, if, if this propulsion system, I mean, it could mean so much for the world. Uh, if we knew how to manipulate gravity in that way, that obviously would be a power source that could be harnessed and utilized in a world where we're running out of coal and oil and all the conventional stuff we've used. Uh, we really badly need another energy source if i mean when you saw these saucers it was how many years ago now well it was in 88 89 88 89 and now 2003 we're starving for energy we're probably going to have wars if it, well we are having wars because of it and there'll be more wars because of it so why do you suppose bob that all of this has been kept from the world I don't know. There's also, you know, there's also a tremendous weapon potential here. Oh, that too. You know, a tremendous weapon potential, maybe more so than energy, because as far as duplicating the, the power system, well, you need access to materials, elements, things of that sort that, that we simply don't have and cannot fabricate. And uh, Well, you know they'd be making weapons. Well, uh, yeah, of course, of course. You know, if you can control, I think I said this on my last interview with you, you know, we have, we have devices that can produce magnetic fields. We have devices that can produce artificial light. But, you know, the big gap is we don't have a machine that can make gravity. You know, there's, there's nothing that does that. Well, you that's, not that's we, a big gap in physics. Or we haven't made it public. And, and, and the question is... Why is this technology still buried? I tell you what, we're at the bottom of the hour. Hold on, Bob. We'll come back and we'll jump right back into the same place. The ability to create or manipulate gravity. Some incredible thing to be sure. And, uh, Bob, we were talking about the, you know, the energy needs of the world. And then you brought up weapons. And you betcha. I mean, do you believe, for example, that they have, in fact, uh, developed weapons using this technology and that we have them now in our arsenal my own personal belief absolutely absolutely huh? absolutely because i saw evidence of that even when i worked there part of the uh part of the briefing contained a couple hints about using gravity as a lens or uh one of the gravity emitters as a lens to focus uh, energy weapons so which, to take a step back, if you're particle beams and other uh, energy-type weapons of that sort disperse quickly in an atmosphere. And uh, it's kind of hard to keep a focused, uh, intense beam on your target. But if you can manipulate gravity, uh, you know, I'll, you can really, really change the dynamics of that. So, What, what would such a weapon do? Well, that's the, they're using a technology there essentially to focus something that's conventional. But if you could maintain the energy density, maintain, uh, you know, essentially a tight focus spot right. of any high intensity energy, you could burn, you know, penetrate, uh, destroy <laughs> different targets. But also, it's also a great defensive thing because... Uh, once you start talking about manipulating gravity and you can create a gravitational field in any plane you wish, you know, things that become possible are, are what we consider science fiction. Now, the popular shields in Star Trek become possible now. Well, how about the not quite so as fictional uh, suggestions made by Ronald Reagan about Star Wars? Right. Uh, you know, you got to wonder if um, some of what that man said at that time came from some knowledge he might have had about what was possible. It, it could certainly have had. I've heard several people talk about Reagan in that way. And I know he made several of those 
uh, yes, he did. speeches with uh, making reference to aliens invading the Earth. And, that's right. And whatnot. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's very possible. Uh, certainly that would have been one of the early conclusions any military mind would have drawn, and that could have easily made it to the top to the president. Ronald Reagan was somebody who said what was on his mind uh, to the consternation of many around him. And, you know, he'd just say what was on his mind, and mm. uh, to hell with the consequences. So one does have to wonder about that. But still, there it is. Maybe we've got the weapons. We didn't use them in Iraq. No, I think these are... These are way too valuable to use in combat. It, these aren't things that have been produced. You know, we have, if we have any, uh, we're using the parts from the craft and their prototypes, and I don't think anybody is risking putting these valuable things into battle. Hmm. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, unless we've developed another source for the materials uh, or have been able to duplicate them, you know, in the past 10 years, I really don't see that we're going to be going anywhere with that. But uh, who knows? Maybe maybe by this time, research has continued and they've actually come up with something. One of the key things that uh, uh, John Lear did during our inter last interview was he said, Hey, Art, I'm going to take you to a briefing uh, and you're going to get to say whether you think... All of this, uh, there should be total disclosure about everything the United States government has done since day one regarding this whole issue of extraterrestrials, what we've learned, what information we have, how we got it, what we've done with it, the terrible things government has done to protect the secrets and all the rest of it. I'm going to lay it all out for you, and you decide whether or not it should be all publicly disclosed. Uh, you know, everybody in, in ufology is screaming for disclosure. And so I'm wondering about you, Bob, um, if you had a litany of things laid in front of you that we had done, some of them pretty terrible, if you buy it, uh, yeah, would, you, would you say that there should be full disclosure, or is this something better kept from the American or the world public? Well, it's not better kept from the American people because, you know, we're, we're supposed to be the government. We hire these guys elect them to their positions to take care of business. Yes, sir. So nothing is supposed to be kept from us. However, you know, there are other countries. We do have an awful lot of people in the world that just hate us because we're alive. And, uh, you know, if you're concerned about weapons and the proliferation of things of that sort, uh, you do need to keep certain things secret from the rest of the world. However, it's one of the things that I had said initially, go ahead and keep all that stuff secret, mm -hmm. but just admit, hey, by the way, <laughs> you know, a long time ago, we <laughs> ran into some of these things. This, this technology is real. There apparently is actual intelligent extraterrestrial life somewhere else. Uh -huh. And, you know, we have a few artifacts and, you know, go ahead and release some stuff to the public. So, look here. You know, here's a hinge made on another world. Just something generic. And, uh, you know, keep all the other stuff secret. But then I can also see the flip side of that. That's going to whet everybody's appetite, and there's going to be a furor over, you know, disclosing the rest of the information. And if the government's been keeping that for secret for so long, what else have they been keeping secret? But well, yes. I don't see the government <laughs> coming clean with any of this stuff. I mean, they're, they're up to all kinds of no good, so... Uh, do you believe that there is uh, a government uh, behind the government, you know, sort of pulling the strings, as it were? I don't know about that. I think ours is pretty <laughs> screwed up as it is, so I don't think it needs anybody else pulling any strings. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Uh, but surely there is uh, some method for keeping this gigantic secret and not uh, not all politicians uh, nor even perhaps uh, all presidents are told about the existence of that do you believe that no i think yeah i think very few people know and one of the things they told me which was one of my first comments there when i finally knew what i was working on uh how do you guys keep this secret yeah and what they told me was this is the easiest thing in the world to keep secret because it's so unbelievable <laughs> And, you know, when you really think about it, they're right. Well, they are, because every, everything just gets uh, dismissed or perhaps 
erased. How much anger do you uh, have for them now? I mean, what they did to you. They virtually erased your life. They brought a steel fist right down in the middle of your life and uh, kind of ruined things for quite a while for, for you. Well, I don't know. I've tried to put this out of my mind, you know, as I fight to try and just put this behind me and forget about everything. You know, a, a lot of people uh, keep prodding me for information and you know, the, it resurfaces in my mind. But for the most part, I, I just try and get rid of this. Uh, at the time, sure, I was pissed off. Uh, more so than you can possibly imagine. Mm. And, uh, you know, as my friends at that time recall, I drove around in my little 280Z with an Uzi. You know, that's the kind of trouble I expected, and I didn't go anywhere without it. But, uh, you know, times have changed. A lot of time has gone by, and... Uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to say. Yeah, it's always in the back of my mind. But, you know, what am I going to do? To this day, I'm still fighting to get some uh, paperwork and, well, some things I can't even talk about. But back back to the way it was so I can be a normal person. You obviously thought they were going to kill you. Oh, no question. Um, that was the impetus for going on the news that way. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, the famous or infamous Channel Eight uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you wanted to tell everybody about that because, of course, not everybody in the rest of the country uh, either recalls or knew about what happened with regard to that. Um, how, explain exactly how that came down. Well, hmm, <laughs> I, I'm wondering how far I should go back. Well, uh, essentially, after. I left the project, um, and it wasn't really voluntary, but uh, uh, I'm <laughs> trying to remember exactly what happened then. I think, it, in fact, I think it was John, that interview took place at John Lear's house. Um, it was George Knapp that talked you into it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a combination of both. I think I had... I had gone down to John Lear's house and uh, really was afraid to go home at that time and hid out there for a while and John said, why don't you go talk to George Knapp and maybe if the stuff's all over the news, they'll just leave you alone. It'd be your way of kind of pushing back. So. George Knapp, folks, is a reporter for Channel 8, um, the uh, CBS affiliate in Las Vegas. And yeah, George he was... Uh, well, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's right. George is just a very heavy-duty uh, investigative reporter for that station. And um, I guess he was sort of doing stories on John Lear at that time. And then somehow you got involved in this. And, and, then, and then, if I remember correctly, uh, you were put on television in a shadow behind something. or <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, it was just a backlit shadow. So... Um you know, you couldn't recognize who I was, and the pseudonym I used was the name of my boss at the time, which was kind of a little smack in the face to say, hey, just back off and leave me alone. And apparently that caused uh, quite a stir, and I got a call shortly after that. And needless to say, they were pretty upset with that move. Do you think but, John, well, I bet they were. Do you, do you think John wanted you to do it to, in essence, back him up at that point? Oh, I'm sure. At that time... Now, I mean, you, you have to look at things at that time. First of all, I got into the project thinking I was going to be working on a new fighter, a propulsion system for a new fighter aircraft. Yes. And uh, I was certainly not one of the people that believed in UFOs. These were people that were just, you know, something to laugh at as far as I was concerned. So, um... I already lost my train of thought. Well, let me put you back in that chair and that night when the interview got done, uh, when it was done, what what did you say to the audience that night? Well, that was essentially just admitting that there were nine craft out there that they were actively back engineering, and you know, attempting to duplicate the power and propulsion system of the craft. And that's that's basically about all that was said. I mean, there were a few details about where it was. And that was enough. That's like taking a match and throwing it on gasoline. What was the reaction like after that? Uh, after oh, it was it was pretty widespread. Yeah, I bet. it went all over the place. It, you know, I had I had seen 
New, because they interrupt. Well, I don't know if they interrupted it, but it was in the middle of the five o'clock news. They oh yeah, did a live broadcast, and and I've seen that exact broadcast repeated on Japanese television and you know in Germany. So it it made the world fast. What was the nickname you used for that, that interview? Dennis. Dennis. Yeah, that's right. They called you Dennis. It's a long time ago now. I must have taken great big ones to sit in that chair and, <laughs> and say that on television. <laughs> yeah, Dennis Mariani was my supervisor at that time. I see. Um, okay, so after that story broke, um, I mean, you must have, you and John probably just sat back and watched the world explode around you. Well, kind of. Yeah, I mean, at that time, you know, John Lear was out there himself saying that uh, there were flying saucers at the test site and, you know, all kinds of stuff that I thought was pretty silly. But uh, as it turned out, you know, he was right. I don't know what information source he had at that time, but... Uh, he had been telling you that, and saying that, so I guess maybe maybe that's the reason that you went to John uh, as as dragging him along, saying, "Hey, I got something to show you." Maybe maybe you just sort of felt as though you owed it to him in some way, huh? Uh, maybe I can't. I actually can't remember the exact reason, but uh, it was just the people around me at the time. I felt obligated to at least give a peek to. Wasn't the, uh, the the tester the tester company that makes models came out with a model of a UFO of a flying saucer, mm -hmm. uh, quite a unique um, scale model of a flying saucer. I have one of them, and um, how much of your input was used to create that model? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. John Andrews from Testers just sat down and said, "Hey, we want to make a model of this, and you want to help us or not?" And I said. Yeah, okay, this is it. And <laughs> okay. they brought uh, a couple guys in, and, um, you know, off the top of my head, I tried to remember some dimensions, and we did some initial drawings, and the, the craft just didn't look right. And he had a couple friends that were, I don't quite remember what they were, they were skilled in, but in any case, they were able to uh, get the correct dimensions by me recognizing the sizes of known objects at various distances sure. and they kind of you know back engineered it from that and were able to get uh, the proper dimensions and when the drawing was done it, that did that did look correct and I think I'm more comfortable with the the final drawings and um, dimensions they came up with and it was I think it came up like to 52.8 feet in diameter or something like that well when you look at the, the tester model today, uh, does uh, do you look at that and say, yup, that's yeah. what I saw? Yeah, no no question. But they, they hit the nail on the head with that. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. How long a process was that for you to accurately finally, you know, I guess it's like uh, going to a police station and going to a sketch artist and have them finally come up with something that matches, you know, the person you saw. If it, I remember it, it took a while. Um, it probably took a month on and off of uh, going over drawings, drawing the layout over and over again, and you know having these these guys look at it and then scale it up and see if it if things fit. And, but it 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 did take it did take quite a while. All right. Uh, am I right or wrong? Do you do you really have? Do you own? A, a missile silo in Roswell, New Mexico? Yeah, John Ferrat and I have a, a project going down there. And uh, it's, it, yeah, it's a, a decommissioned nuclear missile silo just outside of Roswell. And it's not like I wanted a, a place outside of Roswell. It just happened to be where it in was. Roswell, yeah, but uh, how does a person go about getting a missile silo in the first place? I mean, who do you approach? Well, I think they're actually on the internet. If you type in missile silo, there are there are a few left for sale, but they are they are pretty neat. It's uh, I believe the the main where the missile sits is 200 feet deep, and uh, you know these places are uh, quite a deal compared to what the government 
paid for them. I think they paid oh. close to $13 million just for the concrete. Oh, I'll bet. To build these places. And it, it's literally bomb-proof. You can set a, you know, a thermonuclear bomb on the door and set it off and still be drinking beer inside for a while. Well, well, <laughs> why, why did you want a silo? Oh, it was cool. Just because it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, we also have some other plans for it, but... Uh, that you can or can't talk about. No, nah, I'm really not. You obligated really can't to talk, talk about. about. Yeah, I see. Um, but so this is a full decommissioned nuclear missile silo. Yeah. In Roswell. Yeah. <sighs> Just not something that uh, the average person would have or want. And I wish I knew what you were going to do with it. But you just you can't talk about that at all, huh? Well. Not really. I can I can tell you some of the things we're not doing with it. We had uh, not launching missiles. We, we yeah, hope. unfortunately, I couldn't find a reload kit for the place. But uh, Bob, you said you could describe some things that what you you can't do or you might. Well, do one thing or? I do have to correct is um, uh, my partner John Ferrat and I are, are involved in the silo, and John has far more invested in it than I do. So just to say that it's mine personally so you have is not part of a silo. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in in the respect. Um, I mean but did you there's it had to be more well maybe there didn't. I, I you know I was gonna actually put a rocket on my front lawn to impress my neighbors. <laughs> I thought it'd be cool. I mean if you're a neighbor and you see a rocket go up on a guy's lawn. Huh. So do you own a silo for the same reason? Just for just well you said it, it's cool. It is well, cool. no, we, we actually have some serious plans for it. I thought you might. And, uh, you know, you don't invest all kinds of money just for the hell of it. But um, it, it's amazing the amount of rumors that start. And generally, for some reason, when my name's involved somewhere, all kinds of ridiculous stories pop out of the woodwork. But mm. uh, I, I think even uh, Channel 8 carried that story in Las Vegas. Um, there and in fact, when I was down at the silo, uh, we got a call from the police in Roswell, oh. and they sounded kind of embarrassed and said, uh, "You know, we're going to have to come down and check out the facility there." And we asked why, and there was kind of a hesitation. And they said, "I know this sounds crazy, but you know, we have people that actually have come down to the station and said that." They believe you're holding alien hostages underground in, in the, in the <laughs> silo. Oh. Yeah, and, you know, because they filed the report, they actually went down. They're obligated to go check things out. So they had to come down and verify that there's no aliens being held hostage in there. They actually did that? Yeah, yeah, they did that while I was there. And um, <laughs> they Now, that's to, a story in itself. That got reported. I missed that one. Well, that was most recently. Before I moved to New Mexico... Um, what had happened was uh, just a, a, a random guy drove out there and was planning on committing suicide. Now, of all the places in the world this guy could have gone to kill himself, he drove down the road to the silo, parked on top of it, and set his car on fire or something like that. Oh. Anyway, the thing burnt to the ground, and the guy was dead. And uh, prior to that, there's also wild animals, antelope, cattle, whatever in the area, and there's been a couple dead cows out there. So the connection between cattle mutilations and all this stuff started brewing in the minds of some people. So somehow it got around that I was developing a death ray in this underground facility and that I had tested it on cattle, which is why they were dead. And of course, a guy came driving down the road and I vaporized his car and killed him. I anyway, see. And, none, and you maintain that none of this is true. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But uh, it's just amazing the stories that get started. Well, of, co of course, you are Bob Lazar. There is a certain aura around you. And when you connect that with buying a missile silo, people's imaginations naturally go berserk. <laughs> well, berserk is a good word. But, but, then again, you are Bob Lazar. It is a missile silo, and to be honest, you haven't actually answered my question yet about what you're going to do with it, and you say you can't answer that question, and you know that's going to feed rumors. It's got me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay. Well, all right. Well, I, hey, just, you know, I just can't help that. Yeah, Bob, over the years, um, especially uh, in... In the in that time period uh, when you were with John and the whole thing was coming down, um, how much? And you've done a number of public interviews, several with me. How much is left that you can't talk about? Can't. 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 Or unable to. Concerning the UFO. The whole thing, yeah. Information. Yeah. Uh, not a whole lot. But some. There's, there's just a couple little tidbits, and I think I've told you that before. There's a couple things that I need, and this isn't to burn anybody and hold information back, but it's in case somebody claims that they were involved with the project or work there, there are a couple things that only those people will know, and any time that anybody brings those up, when questioned by me, I'll know. Right. So that's that's the only reason. There's there's just a few little bits and pieces of information here and there. All righty, then then let's go down that road for a second. I mean, there there are other others like you, Bob, who worked out in and saw all of that. Um, obviously, there had to be quite a number over the years of people who became aware of that knowledge. Why why are there not a lot more Bob Lazars out there? I don't know. Initially, I was not supposed to be the only one that came forward. But, uh, Not supposed to be? No. You mean you had an agreement with someone? Well, Barry, the guy that I worked with there, uh, was supposed to additionally come forward, but uh, that apparently never happened, so I was left out there in the dark. Twisting in the breeze. Mm -hmm. So Barry, I, I don't know what happened. It, so this Barry had, had promised you he would step forward with you? Well... Kind of, and, you know, I wonder if it's wise, really, to, to comment too much on that. Because mm -hmm. I don't know what Barry's situation is now. But mm -hmm. we had, you know, we had talked about things. But if somebody were to come forward and claim they had seen what you saw, they also know it to be true because they worked there, you would have a couple of questions you'd be able to ask them that would verify the authenticity. Oh, of sure. Instantaneously. Instantaneously. Yeah. All right. Now, why did you move? I mean, you've been a very long time desert rat uh, out here in the Las Vegas area nearby me and, of course, uh, the infamous area 51 S4 and all the rest. I mean, you lived here so long. Why'd you move? Um, you know, after a while, Las Vegas gets to you. I was there and uh, <laughs> certainly working at the test site uh, was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, a little bit of the work I did there when I uh, initially moved to Las Vegas. But after that, um, being out of the scientific field, I, I really went stagnant and really didn't produce or do anything that I really considered worthwhile and just needed to get out of the Las Vegas environment completely. And uh, New Mexico, especially around the Albuquerque area, you know, you have two of the most prominent oh, yeah. national nuclear labs here, Los Alamos and Sandia, and, you know, the cities here are filled with Ph.D. scientists, and it, it just feel, it felt good to get back into, into the mainstream of things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the short time I was here, in the first 18 months, uh, I just began to actually produce what I considered decent work. I started filing for patents and... Uh, you know, as you know, working on the hydrogen system and uh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit things. about that. As a matter of fact, yeah, patents and uh, on hydrogen fuel systems, and I, I know you've had them in your car. You've run your car on hydrogen, did it for a long time, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, whatever patents you have, uh, what's this about a SWAT team coming in and grabbing all of your uh, uh, data and computers? I was. You know, I have to stop you there. We can't even touch that one. I spoke to my attorney after uh, I sent that oh, email. No and, kidding. No, we got to totally just not talk let about that, that, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, at any rate, now that you're back or you're in New Mexico, you feel like you're you're doing good work in in your area once again. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah. I guess it's just a different mindset, and also the immediate area that I live in. You know, moving up isolated in in the mountains in the middle of a forest and, you know, on a lot of acres of land and uh, is different than living right in the middle of Las Vegas and, you know, typically in town. 
So it's just, uh, it's a freer environment, and it, uh, I'm building my own research lab here, and uh, I don't know, it's, it's a lot more fertile ground for, for thinking and actually doing something serious. Well, I do get the sense there is still an awful lot you can't talk about. You said a couple of things, but then we can, we keep touching on uh, several things that still, th there's aspects of it that, that you can't talk about. So, uh, I would say a lot of your life still is surrounded by having to keep secrets. Are you good at keeping secrets? <laughs> no, I think it's been proven pretty well that <laughs> I can't not. do that. But it drives me crazy because the thing I would love, I could spend four hours on the phone more pissed up than you can imagine talking about the SWAT team thing, but I, my hands are tied right now. And oh, no. It, I, maybe what, in the future I can yeah, say something about yeah, no, that. But. No, attorneys are that way. I, I know when there's ongoing stuff. Uh, and they're right, of course. Ultimately, they're right. But it does kill you not to be able to talk about something. Yes, it does. Uh -huh. um, do you think that you're working on, without asking you specifically what you're working on, did any of uh, let's try it this way? Did any of your experience at S4 and with what you saw and what you learned technically have application in any work that you're either doing now or contemplating? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Uh, yes. Um, now I, I'm obligated to ask you about your project, what, what you envision, what you're doing, even in general terms. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're working on? Well, there's a, there's, I, actually I'm overburdened with projects in progress. Mm. Um, as mentioned, as you mentioned, the, the hydrogen fuel systems, uh, that's actually something I've been working on since the late 70s. And uh, that's finally come to fruition, and a lot of the materials needed long-term testing, and they've certainly had it now. Yeah. Um, that's per probably the biggest. Okay, perhaps you uh, can answer a hydrogen question for me. Now, it's, hydrogen is being touted, even the President of the United States is touting it as the way to go. And, uh, but uh, there are others, Bob, who say, look... Um, this is, in a way, all foolishness because, you know, to create hydrogen in amounts that would be good for the public to use, you know, cell, energy cells, fuel cells, uh, would require manufacturing, pollution, the use of energy. In other words, all you're really doing is finding a new storage facility and way to store energy that still has to be uh, produced, frankly, in the old-fashioned way. No, not really. Well, then lay it on me. Not really how. Well, first of all, there's, there's two trains of thought here. Um, the automotive industry, the president and his advisors are all going down the fuel cell path. And for those that don't know, a fuel cell is a device that takes gaseous hydrogen and oxygen, combines them, and makes electricity. And little fuel cell water dribbles out of it because when the hydrogen and oxygen combine... That's the only, the only byproduct is water. Right. And, and so you uh, can use these in cars or to power homes or whatever, right? Right. Well, you can use these things and the, the, their car of the future has fuel cells and an electric motor. And that's how the car is powered. Now, that's, that's very efficient. It's around 35% efficient okay. uh, overall. And uh, that is pretty neat. However, all the technology is not there. The vehicles will be fantastically expensive. None really exist right now in, in production. Mm. And what about the billion cars that are on the road now? <laughs> what, is everybody going to dish out $175,000 for a new car? And on top of that, they want to just replace gasoline pumps with hydrogen pumps and sell you the fuel again. All right. So, uh, let's get back to refuting this. In other words... No matter how it works, Bob, and it's, it sounds like you're almost more on the negative than the positive side of this, but, I mean, no matter how it works, aren't conventional fuels going to have to be used in copious amounts to produce these cylinders of, of, uh, of hydrogen? No, I don't. How the do you figure? The system that I came up with, first of all, converts a conventional car to burn hydrogen conventionally. And, and no uh, fuels with there. how much cost? Well... 
Let me get to that in a second. Right. The actual conversion is not that difficult, not that terribly expensive. Um, I have I have not used any energy producing any of the hydrogen that I make as far as power off the grid, fossil fuels, or whatnot. Hydrogen is easily electrolyzed by water. You know, if you need to prove it to yourself, take a 12-volt battery, put both wires in the water, add a pinch of salt, and you'll see bubbles coming off of one side. Well, some off the other, too. That's and that ought to be hydrogen. Right. Anyway, it's easily produced, and it can be produced... Uh, with solar panels or a wind turbine. I use solar panels. That's where all my hydrogen comes from. I fill up the Corvette with it, and we drive 700 miles on it. And the car will also run on gasoline. All right. So, all that's, right. Uh, and so that's perfected. I mean, it works, right? Right, and it, it's worked for years and years and years. All right. Let's say I buy a conventional automobile for, I don't know, 20, 30 grand, something like that. Um, what would it cost to convert a car like that to hydrogen? You're, well, the big, the big hang-up right now has been the actual storage medium. You don't want to store hydrogen as just a compressed gas because it's dangerous, it's flammable, and on top of that, you need thousands of times more space to hold the hydrogen than you would an equivalent amount of gasoline. Okay. So it, it just doesn't work. Right. You don't want to store it liquid because that's cryogenic, it's dangerous, it's just a big thermos bottle in your tank and it's another big headache. The, the third way is the best way and that's a metal hydride and this is a granular material that absorbs hydrogen like a sponge absorbs water mm -hmm. and it only releases the hydrogen when it's heated and it's, when it's not being heated I can fire incendiary bullets through the hydride tank and it just smolders like a cigarette so it's extremely safe Wow! and this is the material that I store the hydrogen in in the vehicles and for home use. Is this the subject of a patent? Yes. It is. Yeah. Now there are various hydride materials and some were actually very difficult to get a hold of because some of them, like lithium-6 deuteride, which is a, a hydride, actually, well, the material I use is a hydride, the only use for that material is in thermonuclear bombs. And it's restricted, obviously restricted for sale. Yes. Um, and the only reason some of these hydrides are manufactured was for the weapons industry. And they're done so in such small quantities, the cost was very high. Mm. For instance, to convert the Corvette just for the tanks of hydride, we were looking at $15,000 without the hydrogen conversion itself. So this is, you know, that's that's a... A pretty large price tag. Out of line right now. Right. But if, if, if this pro, uh, whole thing were perfected and you had access to the materials and it were done in mass, I'd like to get some idea of what it would cost to convert. Well, we've been working with the hydride manufacturers and uh, they promise a 70% reduction in cost in volume production. So, Does that make it viable? Very much so. I mean, wouldn't you pay... Between forty five hundred and six thousand dollars to have your car converted, you'll have your hydrogen generator at home, so you can drive locally and even up to seven hundred miles away on hydrogen. And if you want, you can always put gas in the tank, and the car will switch over to gasoline when. Uh, you know, when well, necessary. okay. I've always wanted to know: Would I need to do that? Uh, it, would hydrogen give me the same uh, equal amount of horsepower? Would I be happy with a hydrogen fuel? You get a little less, you know. For instance, in a in a larger engine. In fact, that's the reason we converted the Corvette. Was uh, a lot of these alternate fuel cars, you see little Ford Escorts and these little tiny motors, and it leaves everybody wondering: Well, can't you power something substantial? Mm -hmm. So we purposely did a large V8 engine. And, uh, yeah, it still lights up the tires and, you know, screams away. There's a little loss in horsepower, but in a, in a large engine, you're not going to detect a 10% loss in horsepower. But you're still having a lot of fun, though. I mean, it's, uh, it's enough horsepower that, that generally most people are going to be happy campers. Oh, sure, and most people are willing to pay that price tag if they never, ever have to go to a gas station again. And who wouldn't? On top of that, you're not supporting... You know, the oil cartel that's right. or anything else that's going on or polluting the air. And by the way, uh, it's probably going to screw up my little scenario pleading for some more Bob Lazars to come forward. But out of curiosity, 
uh, Bob, uh, tonight all across uh, the world. People who have been in involved uh, up at Area 51, S4, have seen what you have seen. These people, they're probably listening, Bob. A lot of them are listening. You can be sure of it, actually. And so what would you say to these um, these people? Would, would, would you say, you know what, Art's right. Why don't you go ahead and email them, and why don't you come on and tell what you know? Would you advise them to do that? <laughs> no. no. No? I knew you'd screw it up. <laughs> Don't tell anybody what you uh, know. Uh, <laughs> Take my word for it. I knew word. you'd do that. that. I knew it. Yeah, well, that, that that really is my message. Just forget it. Forget it, huh? Yeah, just forget it. Don't bother saying anything. It's not worth the hassle. It's not worth it. It's not. And for the most part, nobody's going to believe what you have to say anyway. So don't, don't even think of doing it. Oh, thanks for the help. I'm, I'm sorry, but you asked. <laughs> yeah, and I knew, I knew, I guess, what I was in for. Um, okay, well, I know, but still, all right, but let me take the other side of it, Bob. Uh, let, let's fight this a little bit. Um, the, there's a lot of people out there, like Stephen Greer, who I have on tomorrow night, and they really do make a compelling, damn strong case that, gosh, Darn it all, if we've been visited by aliens, if they've really been here, if we have their craft, their technology, and even bodies, and this is such an incredibly large story, so important to the human race, that nobody has a right to keep anything like this secret, and it should be told, it should be out in the open, and if these Bob Lazars don't come in and talk to me and others, then how in the hell are we ever going to find out? Because you said it yourself, the government sure isn't going to tell us. Yeah, and, and I agree with that completely. Well, then how can you say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, from personal experience. <laughs> yeah, in other words, you're not really a crusader at all, are you? No. You're not? No. No. I'm not involved in UFO research. I don't I follow the stories. I don't do lectures. I don't... Uh, I know you don't. You know, I, I, I don't do any of that stuff. You know, I, I try and put it behind me, you know, and a, a lot of people really... You know, have the drive to get this stuff uncovered, but uh, generally those are the people that haven't been involved with anything. And, uh, you know, sticking your neck out on the line really does change your life forever, and it's, it it's not a positive thing. Uh, you know, people really get the wrong impression. They think that, you know, this is a, uh, you know, a big boost in some way to you, and, it, and it's not by any stretch of the imagination. So, I, you know, why would I recommend somebody do that? Well, a lot of people, Bob, think that, uh, I mean, when they, they have these reality TV shows and people line up for blocks and wait two days through the ice and the cold to get a chance to be, you know, have FaceTime on television. We do live in that kind of world, and so some people suspect your motive is that. But, um, yeah, but I hate being, <laughs> being on TV. I hate doing interviews, and I don't do lectures and all that. How could that possibly be my motivation? Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I, I believe me, I do understand. Do you have any knowledge? Diane up in Washington wants to know. I get a computer message every now and then. A lot of them, actually. Uh, do you have any knowledge, it's a good question, of any agreement between any group of aliens and humans or the U.S. government? Do you believe that to be true or know it to be true, that there is some understanding. I, I've heard rumors of that uh, from various sources, but, um, you know, I, I don't have any at first-hand knowledge of an actual Ag agreement, agreement that yeah. was cut between anybody. Uh, there's a lot of speculation, of course, about an agreement to allow some human beings, for example, to be abducted, you know, for research in return for let's say, technology, uh, and John Lear alluded to all that and said that they, in essence, reneged on that aspect of what was supposed to be a deal. <laughs> of course, uh, to make, you, you know, you'd never make that kind of thing public. If you had made a deal to shuffle off some of your citizens at random to guys who were going to do God knows what to them, chop them up, cut them up, whatever they do, you could never talk about that ever. Uh, I, I don't know. I find that kind of hard to believe. Um, so then John has gone too far for you. <laughs> Is that right? I'm sure he's listening. Yeah, I'm sure he's yeah, listening. That John knows he's gone too far for me. John's convinced that there are people living on, or some sort of beam, beings living on, on uh, that, Venus and some other local planets. That's and, right. Uh, 
and that drives me crazy. Does it? it, it yeah, it absolutely does, and a bunch of the things he says. Well, he's convinced but, there are artifacts on the moon, gigantic artifacts on the moon and Mars, um, and others have said that as well. Richard C. Hoagland and others have said there are uh, things on, on the moon. Uh, in fact, you know what? There's a speculation that the President of the United States, uh, Mr. Uh, George Bush, is about to make a speech in which he said he's going to say the United States is going to go back to the moon. There's going to be a shuttle mission to go back to the moon. I heard that. Yeah. Yeah, pretty, I heard pretty. he's supposed to make some sort of announcement. Uh, uh, and, and we would do it presumably with a shuttle, which is really, really? yeah, really How interesting. How are you going to get the shuttle? I, don't ask me. I have no idea, but that, that's what I'm hearing. And, and actually, I've, I've heard Mr. Hoagland say it's possible. I mean, the, you know, if they used every... In other words, once, I think Richard has said, or someone said, once you get into orbit, uh, you're halfway to anywhere. Well, sure, but if you want to actually get on the moon, it's a different story. You know, the, the orbiter wasn't designed to do that at all, and in fact, it needs to be replaced with something else. Yeah, it's getting pretty old. yeah. Still, uh, that's apparently what's going to be announced. I could turn out to be wrong, but I don't know of any other spacecraft that we have in uh, current production that would get us to the moon. Do you? No, but, uh, you know, we do, we do still have a Saturn V sitting there. A that Saturn V could do it. Uh, well, it was designed to do it, it with a lunar it. module and everything. It's sitting there in Florida. Just, yeah. You know, yeah, dust it, the thing off and launch it because really, they stopped the would, program right, you know. You think it would be all right? Not like old ammunition? I mean, it's pretty old now. Well, you know, it's, it, for the most part, you know, it's metal and components. Just s sit there with something you know that works. Mm -hmm. Don't be, do what the United States typically does and reinvent the wheel constantly. Mm. That got us to the moon many times. It worked. Just update it with some modern materials, electronics, and components, and use it since it's there. And stop spending huge amounts of money doing nothing. What, what can you imagine our motivation would be for going back to the moon? I mean, we did go, uh, most people believe, uh, something, actually I don't think we even went, but uh, we, I believe we went and we got rocks and we didn't get very many surprises and so what could we do on the moon today that we didn't do then? That always seemed more sensible to me to, to make a small moon base as opposed to a space station. Um, oh, really? Why? Well, for various reasons. First of all, the space station is limited in what it can do. I, and I know a moon base is much more difficult to get to. It doesn't have to be large, but you can at least try uh, some uh, and test out some technology on, you know, on trying to manufacture fuel, do some small refining, see what you can get from the surrounding environment. You know, there, there have been reports, I think, the, I don't know, was it the Cassini? Some radar mapping craft uh, over the past four or five years detected that there were supposedly large frozen areas of water That's correct, on yes. the moon. Right. However, they just went over that data again. And we had another arbor and now are, are refuting some of that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if you've got water, you've got energy, and you've got the possibility for all kinds of stuff. But uh, So we're back to a foggy area. There may not be enough water there to manufacture fuel, which would be a necessity. Right. So... Right. Uh, that would make it uh, uninhabitable if if uh, if they're completely reversing themselves now. It's kind of strange to me. A lot of people believe, uh, Bob, that there are things on the moon, large glass structures, incredible things that were hidden from the uh, the world when we went to the moon and have been hidden ever since. And and that that's the reason they say we haven't gone back. I believe John is one of the people who believes that. Yeah, he is. I am not one of the people that believes that. You are but, not? Uh, no. No, absolutely not. Then why go back, Bob? Exploration. You know, why go to the top of the mountain? You know, that's, it, it, it's a completely different world now than it was in the 60s. There's a lot more technology, so there's, there's a lot more we can investigate there. You know, and the original reason to go to the moon was never to research the moon. You know, aside from beating the Russians there, the original intention was only to see the feasibility or to investigate the feasibility of making a small base there and launching a Mars mission from the moon. This was all about going to Mars. 
the moon was only supposed to be because it would be easier to get there from the moon, less gravity, so on and so forth. Sure. And that was just to be looked upon as a, you know, as a potential launching site for a Mars mission. So the, the interest was never in the moon. I mean, we, we pretty much knew it was just a rock up there anyway. The interest is, you know, has always been in Mars, but Mars isn't that easy to get to. Unless you had a moon base, and that would help. Well, yeah, that would help. It's, it's a shortcut, and, uh, you know, you could store fuel there. There would be, you know, if, if plans had gone how they should have, uh, you know, maybe we would have already been to Mars. But I think that's, that's the frontier we should look at, is investigating that or go to, go to Europa. There's plenty of things in our immediate solar system that are, you know, potentially fascinating. And, you know, Europa has probably the best chance of life uh, you know, in our solar system, and, it, you know, even the hardcore skeptics at NASA pretty much agree there's a good chance there's something in the oceans there, so... But, Bob, if we've got technology that can manipulate gravity, and damn, it was back in the early 90s when you knew that we had that, uh, here we are launching, whether it's a Saturn V or a shuttle or however we get back to limp back to the moon... Um, and for what reason, I'm not sure about, but what, whatever. Uh, we're using ancient, buggy-like technology compared to what you know exists now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't care what spacecraft they've come up with. In my eyes, they still look like fireworks. <laughs> and they've proven themselves to be that on occasion. Yes. But it's, uh, it, it is. It's archaic technology. And we do have something that operates differently. However, it has limited fuel, a limited lifespan, and we don't want to lose it. So, it, it, and we're, as far as I knew at the time, we couldn't even come close to duplicating even the, the, the most basic parts of the device. So, it, uh, you know, what are you left with? You're left with so your own archaic method of transportation to yeah. other planets and so, you can only investigate what's going on around you so and then we're Bob, stuck. we have been unable to decipher the the manner in which or duplicate the manner in which gravity is manipulated by the devices on on the craft that you saw obviously we failed or what I, I, in other words otherwise we'd be using this technology so we failed well it quite possibly now again i hesitate because i'm talking about my knowledge from the early 90s and late 80s. Uh -huh. I don't know what's happened up till today. But uh, as far as I knew back then, yeah, we've, we've failed. That's, that's the bottom line. Do we're you think not going to be duplicating that. Do you think these craft, uh, when tested, were taken outside the Earth's atmosphere? No. You do not? No, I, I know that for a fact. For a fact? Yeah. And I don't... I don't... Well... Well... <laughs> what, why? I just, uh, no, go ahead. Mm. Just whisper it in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I pretty much know that for a fact. Um, why, out of curiosity... This is what we're getting right, real close to one of the areas that I said that I, I purposely don't talk about so I know if anybody's been involved with a project, which has to do with the craft and where it's gone. Oh. So that, that, this is why you're hearing my hesitation on this. Okay, well, the, the next thing out of my mouth was going to be, why do you think, if we thought, or we had... Well, let, look, this is a very valuable article, and it's an operating craft. I don't know if the other crafts were operating. We know this one does. There's only one of them. Uh, you know, so, in other words... One of a kind of thing. Would you risk taking this out of... You know, of the Earth's gravitational pull and losing it in space. Yeah, you no. it's a very good point. It's a very good point. You know, this you, is their prized possession. And no. you believe we still have that safely wherever. By the way, do you think it's still up there? Or do you think it's been moved? And if so, where do you suppose? I don't know. You know, I always thought that that was an odd place to put it. Because in the, uh, you know, early days of the nuclear weapon development, some of the best places that they kept everything were in the South Pacific, like Kwajalein Island and, and things of that sort. And, uh, it's a good point. You, know, you, you don't have any looky-loos there. You yeah. have no hassles from, from anybody. You're in the middle of nowhere, and nobody can get there without you seeing them. What and, a uh, tremendous point. And that's where 
I would have put it. I wouldn't have built this secret base in the middle of Nevada, you know, outside of Las Vegas. The, and the only reason they moved the nuclear test site to Nevada was because it was just too expensive running supplies back and forth and all the personnel to the South Pacific. Well, you don't have that problem with the ET program because it's limited personnel, limited supplies, and, uh, you know, go hide it in the middle of the ocean on an island like they did with everything else. So uh, if I was going to put it somewhere, that's where it would be. Why do you think instead it ended up here in Nevada? I don't know. Huh. I don't know. Uh, I mean, because obviously there are going to be more people uh, conceivably seeing w what's going on. Um, There's got to be a reason. I, Somebody I, I, must they, have, you know. I mean, Bob, they still drive up to the mailbox. People take videos. People take pictures. So then there's another great theory that you might want to com comment on. That is that they want there to be a slow time release of information. They want rumors. They want talk about this subject uh, for some reason that fits their agenda. Otherwise, put it in the South Pacific and, you know, nobody's... Well, there, there may be some other shortcomings of having it out in the middle of the ocean that, you know, that we're not thinking of, but... Uh, Perhaps. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe they need lots of supplies to get... To, to deal with this thing and maybe and they the figured it, and maybe they figured if it crashed it's going to be deep down under the pacific somewhere potentially and we'd lose it that way that's quite possible too uh, the desert is good for one thing isn't it it's uh you know it's just there and it's fairly arid and you'd definitely be coming down on land if you landed in a Strange place. <laughs> Anywhere in Nevada, yeah. Yeah. So you, you maybe your original point is actually the reason yeah, it could be. That they, they wouldn't want to risk losing the one model they've got. Yeah, then the, you, you figure they're still working on trying desperately to back engineer this? Or do you think by now they've done it? It's been a long time. It sure I would, has. I would hope they have made some su substantial progress in 10 years. But, um, you know, if you don't have access to exotic materials... Uh, then you're what are stuck. you going to do? No fuel, and that's you know, that. it's like uh, like I said before, being you know back in the 1800s, and if you want to make something out of plastic, you know, all you can do is look at it and say, hey, this is really neat, but you know, how do we make this stuff? And yeah, uh, and hold on, hold on. We're coming up in in a moment, Bob Lazar is going to attempt to answer your questions. So, uh, I guess what I would say is. Uh, Prepare yourself, Bob, because uh, you never know what's going to come. <laughs> All right, it's 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 fun, Bob. Don't don't worry. It's actually <laughs> it's fun. What's uh, the John Lear test, by the way? Oh, what's the John Lear test? Uh, it's really cool. Uh, to use your phrase, John uh, took me to a briefing. In essence, he said, "Art, uh, imagine you're going to this briefing." And I'm going to lay the briefing out for you, showing you slides and, um, you know, putting things on the blackboard. And I'm going to explain to you everything the United States uh, and world governments have ever done regard the whole ET issue. And you tell me at the end of it if you would say, okay, make it all public. Okay, yeah, this is what you had touched on before. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, at the end of it, I said, no, I wouldn't. Oh, it, really? Like, oh, absolutely. And uh, I... Why? Uh, now, that really intrigues me. Why would you say that? Uh, because... Because some of the things that John said are so far beyond the pale that the religious implications, the social implications, uh, the fact that I do believe people would go to go berserk, I mean completely berserk, it would take down our government, it would disturb the world, it would disturb the force, it would be... <laughs> you really think people would, would really wouldn't be able to handle this? Well, you've got to remember now that the test was given from the John Lear perspective. And remember that John believes a lot of things to be true that you don't, right? I am quite aware of And so <laughs> to take the John Lear test, you've got to take what he says as gospel. In other words, here's what some of the terrible things we've done, really terrible things. Would you 
make it public. And if you had to assume that everything he said there is correct, I guarantee you, I'll, I'll bet you you'd come up with the same answer. So, Well, yeah, I come up with the same answer without that. But, uh, I mean, I truly hope <laughs> everything John Lear believes isn't true. But uh, Me too. <laughs> oh, me too. No. But, believe but me. I have been proven wrong before about many other things, so who knows? All right. You ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, here we go. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. No, Bob Lazar. Uh, <laughs> I've got John on the mind here. Bob Lazar, how you doing? Hi, Art. Hi, Bob. Hey there. Howdy. What's well, a pleasure to talk to both of you. It's been a while since I talked to you, Art. Well, glad to have you back. Um, Bob, I just missed meeting you by day one time, and I regret that. Um, I Where was that? You, that was down in uh, Nevada. Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering if you knew about a material called Starlight. Um, it was supposedly created by a couple of scientists, but I've always had suspicions it was, um, you know, alien technology. S Starlight? <laughs> what, what, what is this material, sir? Well, a physicist told me about this material. It's like um, two liquid plastics, and when you put it together, it forms an indestructible solid. Mm -hmm. uh, a nuclear blast won't touch it. Nothing will um, destroy it. Have you heard of such a material, Bob? No, I'm... I, I'm and, pretty skeptical about a claim like that. That uh, Well, it's not supposed to be classified, and it came, came from a pretty reliable source. And also, John wanted me to ask you about the orange crate in the crater... Copernicus. John wanted you to ask him about the orange crate? Right, the crate on the moon. John who? Lear? Uh, John, John Lear, yes, that's correct. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about. He uh, showed uh, me a picture one time, and there was a perfectly square object on a on a moon picture and said, well, what's this orange crate doing there? And we oh. were arguing about, uh, you know, some of the images from the moon and this these grainy little things with a couple dots, and John was claiming, well, that's just the reflection from a giant, uh, you know, glass dome over so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, But anyway, he did have some pictures that, you know, I couldn't explain. But uh, Well, you know, Bob, uh, and some of what John says is pretty wild. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But on, on the one hand, Bob, you're somebody who's actually seen alien craft. Most of us haven't. So to have seen what you've seen, uh, are the things then John says really so crazy? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, see, a lot of people would say, flying saucers, we got them, you've seen them, oh, come on, that's crazy. Right, that's, I know, that's crazy, and maybe it makes me a hypocrite for saying so, but uh, that's, look, I am the first one to admit that if somebody came forward to me with my identical story and laid everything in my lap, uh -huh. I'm not sure I'd buy it. So I, I can't expect anything else from anybody else. And in fact, I almost prefer people don't believe it because then I get hassled less about it. Martin, uh, Martin in San Rafael says, and I think this is uh, accurate and why I love interviewing you, it says, Lazar continues to be the most credible witness of all. Straightforward, direct, not self-serving. No books, tapes, no website, nothing to sell. He just describes what he saw reluctantly at that. He makes a believer of this skeptic. So, in that way, you really do sell your story. I mean, you're so damn low profile about all of this, like you don't want to Well, it's not it. a business. It's a, I'm just relaying, you know, what happened to me at the time, and, and that's it. You know, it, it, that's the end of the story, and, uh, you know, where it's gone and why, the you know, wh how all this stuff came about is beyond my scope of knowledge, and I don't profess to know anything that I, you know, haven't been exposed to, but, uh, you know, I will stand on uh, what I have you know. seen. And, I've and got know. that, but, I mean, as incredulous as it sounds, um, why not b believe other incredulous things? I mean, if there are saucers here, if there were bodies recovered, if we actually have aliens, then certainly some of the stories about aliens could easily be true. Well, and, and maybe so, but, but you don't know hard, I'm spoiled. Yep. I had some things verified to me and had hands-on experience. I got to touch them, I got to see them, I got to analyze them and said, okay, this is real. 
Now, for the layman or researcher or whatever that hasn't, everything is in the same category to them. It's all conjecture. You know, yet I've had some things proven to me, and I hold on to those like an anchor. Okay, I know this is real, but I don't know about anything else. I all don't right. know if Betty and Barney Hill were abducted, but they have a compelling story. I don't know if the Roswell crash occurred, but that's a compelling story. Some of the stories you hear are totally, totally illogical and don't make sense. And to me, they fit in the category, you know, you try and maintain an open mind and remain scientific about yes. it. But, there, you know, you have prejudices in either direction, you know, as most intelligent people do. And, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, I don't believe everybody that says they were abducted were, was abducted. Um, but they might have been. How would I know? It's just my own personal beliefs. No, of course not. I, 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 don't, I don't believe it all either, Bob. Or even, I might even go as far as say large chunks of it that I don't believe. But, but, um, some of this I do believe is true, and based on what you saw and you know to be true, then it's not too hard to imagine that there was interaction. We might not know the exact parameters of that interaction, but there was interaction with aliens. Ch chances are there was, yeah. in some way, shape, or form over, you know, over a period of time. By the way, uh. on another note, I, you know, I get so many emails about this, um... Apparently in some other show, and I just got three more recently. Yes. Some other show, you spoke to somebody, a female, that said, <laughs> they claimed that I took her out to Area 51 and showed her around. That's right. Does this ring a bell to you? Oh, absolutely. I, I remember that. Yes. This is the most ridiculous story I've ever heard. So that didn't happen either, huh? As if they... As, allow visitors to top secret security install it, th th that's absurd who would even claim something like that <sighs> so, yeah so, in either case that's you know it's just a, one of the another one of those knuckleheads that uh just likes to hear themselves talk for some reason huh. okay um as a matter of fact i had an email from this person just uh yesterday bob really yes she imagines quite a re relationship uh, with you <laughs> oh really? Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh. Not, not true though. No. <laughs> <laughs> First time caller line. You're on the air with Bob Lazar. Yo ho. Okay. Um, I'm calling because <clears throat> I'm a physics student and. Uh, All right. So. Speak up good and loud. Oh, okay. That's better. I'm, uh, I'm calling about the gravitational um, amplifier system. Uh -huh. I'm interested in this because I'm a physics student, and I was thinking that. Um, Kind of at the forefront of physics research now is kind of a push to detect uh, gravitational waves, and which is a tough thing to do, and probably ultimately discover the <clears throat> gravitational particle, the graviton. And I was thinking about this three-pole um, uh, system that you described as very directional, and uh, maybe <clears throat> maybe a gravitational current is involved. I was wondering if that maybe hints at why we can't figure out what is going on there. Do um, you have any thoughts on that? Well, this is more of the research I wanted to conduct while there. While I wanted to get down to the hardcore research and gravity and, and how the energy propagates by itself. And by the way, I don't, I don't believe there are gravitons. I don't believe there's particles involved. I don't believe it, it's even a wave-particle duality, mm. you know, like light photons are. I, you know, I think this is, well, it's, it, it appears to be more of a wave effect. Mm -hmm. And ex exactly how it propagates is, at least I don't personally understand that. It almost seemed to propagate as microwaves did, since <laughs> any time inside the craft, the gravity... Uh, the base of gravity wave was rooted anywhere from the reactor to the amplifiers. It always traveled inside tuned pipes. So, uh, again, that implies at a specific frequency you should have some sort of gravitational effect if it's just a basic, you know, carrier wave of some sort. But, you know, that that doesn't appear to be true. So it's something, it's something more than that. Well, we know, don't we, that uh, microwave can be carried in, like, oblong tubes, right? Waveguide? Right, exactly, waveguides. So that, that's what so connected the reactor to yes. the, uh, the skin of the craft and ultimately to the... So then whatever the, whatever the nature of this wave is, you could imagine it like microwave because it, it was carried, according to your physical description, kind of the same way. 
Right, but if it's just a basic wave, you know, you could just set up a high-frequency oscillator, and then as you slowly increase the frequency, you get different effects. You know, you get microwave, you get... It, it, it's all part of the electromagnetic spec spectrum, and you can get x-rays and whatever, and you should just run into gravity at some point, but, but you don't. So there's, there's something else there, but they were, they were so concerned about the actual application of it, they weren't really concerned about, you know, the research into the, the basics of it, which... You know, probably if it would, would have been done that way when I was there, I at least I think it would have given us a clue, at least a better clue, of how to use it and how to duplicate it. But again, you think, Bob, don't you, that uh, they're now still, if they haven't done it, they're certainly pursuing it. You wouldn't give up on something like that, would you? Are you kidding? Not a chance. Not a chance. Yeah, I'm so, sure just tremendous amounts of money are being funneled into this, and so then I'm sure they continue to handpick specific people yep. that they can think, anyway, are going to keep their mouths closed and, <laughs> and uh, you know, be, be involved with it. But uh, I, there was a frustration even when I got there. By the way, I wonder what happened to the person that picked you. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> hey, caller, right. caller, anything else? Uh, yeah, actually, <clears throat> I was wondering if, if Bob has it. I'm sorry, Mr. Lazar, I shouldn't. Uh, That's Bob is fine. Mr. Lazar is my dad. <laughs> I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to the propagation speed of the wave. We know light travels at a certain speed. Right. Um, or at least we assume it's a constant speed. Do you think, um, you think that gravity is different? Yeah. Good, good question. Yeah, excellent question. Because for all in, from all indications, the propagation is instantaneously, and I know that that upsets everything. But remember, gravity in itself distorts time and space, yeah. and every way we attempted to measure the propagation from the reactor base to the emitters themselves, there was no delay at all. And so, hmm. I believe that I, I don't know if the wave is actually propagating instantly or the fact that it's a gravitational wave is distorting the time space around it and making it appear as it's an instantaneous propagation. But that's, th those are the results that we got. Bob, you said um, you actually measured no delay at all. I, how carefully was that measured? I mean, no delay at all is quite a statement to make. I, you could measure this. Right. So, right. So. There, was, there, was, there was no delay at all. And we... Uh, uh, again, envisioned other potential uses. You know, here's a sure. look at communication to Mars is still a flat 20 minutes between our little robot orbiters and, and things of that sort. Uh, you know, here you have the potential if, in fact, there is instantaneous propagation of gravitational waves, uh, you know, here's uh, a fantastic communication device where there's no delay, where you can talk in real time at great distances. So the... Uh, you know, obviously, there's just tremendous implications of this technology. Even time travel. It's it's possible. You know, gravity distorts time, and and if gravity, if the speed of gravity, which is not defined, is faster than light, then you certainly have time travel based on that alone. Well, you know, like they say, time travel is a lot more common than you think. Time travel in the future to the future happens all the time. All you have to do is stand there. <laughs> you stand on a high mountain, go into a spacecraft, travel fast. You do slip nanoseconds into the future. Time travel backwards is debatable whether or not that's even possible. Well, but, we're uh, off on a tangent. Call right. her, call her any, any yeah. final thing. Yeah. Uh, I guess there's one other thing. Um, you notice you, you, uh, you mentioned an element 115. I'm assuming that's atomic mass number. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think that goes further than the periodic table. Is that true? Mm. Right, that's correct. So, <clears throat> so maybe... Um, Maybe that kind of uh, insinuates that you're dealing with a higher amplitude gravity waves and just, I guess, more to start off with if you're going to amplify it. I mean... Well, yeah, there's something unique about that element. Um, just like there's something unique about the nuclear elements we use in, re in reactors. But th something apparently happens different there that doesn't... And I know there were previous attempts to duplicate what was going on with other materials, other nuclear materials, mm -hmm. and there was no success in that. So there is something very unique about the fuel and specifically what it is. You know, on an atomic scale, we were only just beginning to look into that. So, Bob, I heard some rumors about 
uh, some scientists speculating about or perhaps lab work going on something surrounding element 115. It's just I, between when you told your story and now, sometime or another, I remember hearing about some legit science dabbling with a concept of 115 or something. I can't remember. Do you yeah, I, I believe it was the lab for heavy ion research in Darmstadt, Germany. And at the time, they were on the cutting edge of coming up with new elements. And I, they were... Uh, they were shooting for producing element 115 at one point, and um, they were using a new technique. Instead of bombarding something with neutrons, they were just uh, slamming uh, nuclei together, and <laughs> somehow it was fusing into heavier elements. But I don't think they, they reached it. And in fact, I don't know if it was the same lab, but... Uh, Somebody found out that there was false data. I mean, the last heavy element that was claimed that might have been 113. Or what do we like think? Uh, what do we think the uh, the properties of this element would be generally? Well, that, that's hard to predict. I mean, we certainly observed some unique properties of it. it it's it's incredibly heavy and incredibly dense. Um, aside from that, it uh, the way the reactor worked in the craft was like a small accelerator and it constantly bombarded the 115 which transmuted and immediately decayed and that's when it produced its gravitational pulses and as wow. a byproduct it produced a tremendous amount of heat and Got, inside gotcha. this one Hold, listen. okay all right we're at the bottom of the hour hold on uh, this is really good stuff bob lazar is my guest from the mountains of new mexico directly to you and with you right now here is bob lazar bob Yes. You, you ready for more? Sure. Yeah, these are pretty good people. And you were in the middle of... Uh, I, I don't want to miss out on anything else you'd like to say about the propulsion system and how Element 115 was acting in the process. <laughs> you know, I was on a roll at the minute, and now I can't quite... Well, you remember you said it was, bomb it, was, it was hitting Element 115. Oh, how the reactor operated. Uh, I yeah. guess I drifted onto that. And yes. how the 115 itself was bombarded... Uh, release the, um, in some way, shape, or form, releases uh, a pulse of a uh, gravitational wave and kind of as a byproduct uh, releases a tremendous amount of heat and that heat is converted to electricity which runs the craft. However, there's no wiring or any conventional uh, connectors or controls or anything of that sort on the mm. craft. But uh, all incredibly fascinating, and you know, to a scientist, it's it's a dream come true. So yeah, yeah, sure. In some respects, I I regret the way things turned out, but uh, I don't know. Maybe eventually, we'll all find out what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I I wonder. Uh, I really wonder as the world grows short of oil and the wars are raging because of it and we prepare to go back to the moon maybe in the shuttle of all things. Uh, I don't know. It just seems like if all of this really is there and yet, and yet I guess the answer is that you suggest we have as of, well, the date you knew anyway, not been successful in the back engineering attempt, so we don't have it down yet, or if we do, for some reason we're not willing to begin to release it. I mean, you'd think uh, they could do it through industry, you know, sort of sliding things slowly into industry as some development or something just to get it into the economy. Uh, possibly. It and maybe that's already been done. But um, every time somebody points at something, you know, there is also conventional explanations for it. We really haven't seen anything, you know, incredibly amazing pop up. We see improvements over mm. products here and there and, uh, you know, a, a couple things. But there really hasn't been any quantum leaps, you know, in recent times. Well, you may recall, if you ever heard uh, Colonel Corso's story before he passed on, that he suggested that's exactly how a number of things made it from the Roswell crash to modern industry. It's pretty interesting stuff. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Bob Lazar. Hello. Hello. Yes, hi. Okay. Uh, hi, Art. Hi, Bob. How are hey you? Hey there. Speak up good and loud, sir. Okay. Um, this is Alan from Colorado, and I have three questions, so I hope you can bear with me. All right. But my first question is, is uh, if Aldrich Ames of the CIA can go to jail for so many years, um, because he revealed government secrets, um, how is it that Bob, um, you know, was able to pull this off? 
And then my second okay, question... Okay, well, let's do them one at a time. Okay. Uh, Bob, uh, pretty good question. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd been revealing secrets of the magnitude that we've been talking about tonight, uh, well, of course, uh, I, so I can answer... Well, what would question. you tell me for, you know... Oh, you I know when somebody gives away, you know, secrets, uh, satellite secrets or other technology secrets, and, you know, that information has to be brought out. So, okay, you're going to take me to court and say, okay, you released the information. What did he release? Oh, well, secret stuff. Well, what? You know, they, you're not going to trick them into admitting what they're trying to keep secret. Yeah, and something of this magnet, exactly so. Uh, so I guess I would answer that, caller. I mean, after all, if they charged him with something, they would simply underscore everything he said. Next question. Okay, the next question is, are there not simpler ways to create gravitational propulsion effects, um, you know, like with scalar waves, possibly? I mean, I mean we're talking uh, element 115. This whole procedure seems so exotic and so advanced. Can we not work we with cannot. what we have now? There have been gra there have not been gravitational waves produced in any other method, and there are claims as such all over the place. And people say you can do it with these mercury engines. I've heard scalar waves. I've seen you know all of that data. The bottom line is, it's not real. Next. Okay, and last general. question. Um, T. Townsend Brown, uh, John Searle, uh, Victor Schauberger with his Vortex technology, John Keel, Otis T. Carr, all these researchers, uh, which this relates to the second question, and I think I know how you're going to answer it. Um, how do you feel about what they've so-called contributed to gravitational propulsion technology? Contributed where? Where is it? Show me one. Bring it down here. I'll even fly and see it. Every time I've wasted my time on that, looking at everybody that's claimed any of that stuff, it's never panned out. It's like perpetual motion. The same. Yeah, there's there's I've plenty been. of claims, and you know sure. people want you know are looking for funding to research this or do that, and you know for the most part, not for the most part, there is no device of any sort that can create a gravitational wave now. And go ahead and prove me wrong. Other than what was at S4. Damn, you are such a reasonable person. No, but that's that's a fact. Please yeah, but, prove I, me wrong. Well, I will, I, I'll, I'll oh, hey, listen, come I'm, and check out what I'm you're going to claim. With but, you all the way, but you you see that that's what makes your other claims so damn legit in my mind. Just like that person who fast blasted me. Jeez, Louise, in every other way, you're so. Now that I'm I'm not belittling these people that are doing this work, you know, T. Thompson Brown. Many others were brilliant people doing work, and yes. I, I think a lot of the things they observed have other explanations. Yes. And, uh, you know, just because something lifts off the ground does not make it gravity propulsion. But gravity propulsion, I define as something that's acting directly against gravity, and I don't mean being lifted by electrostatic force or something like that, something that's actually you know, counteracting. Your, your skepticism everywhere else just uh, is so strange in light of what you say uh, to the rest of us. East, east, Look, I barely believe my own story <laughs> happens to me. East that's just how big of a skeptic I am. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Bob Lazar. Hello, Bob. Hi there. Hey there. It's nice speaking to both of you. And to you, sir. Where are you? Out of I'm curiosity. from Pasadena. My Pasadena. Name's Andy. Okay. Yes, for over 20 years, I've been within the research of exobiology. I don't want to mention any names, but my ex-father-in-law, who was with the CIA at Groom Lake, before he died of Agent Orange, he asked me if there's anything I would like to know about Area 51. And mm. I said, yes. Is the government cover-ups of UFOs and ETs true? He said, yes, because he stood guard several feet away within one of the hangar bays guarding ETs from the UFO that was being brought from one place to another. But hmm. this person, is your dad, has passed on? Yes, he passed away. See, he was all fed up with the government for what they were doing to him because he spent so much time in the service and all that, you know, with them that they wouldn't do any more for him. And so he just said to heck with it. Hmm. Yeah, they have a pretty bad record of taking care of their own people. Right. But, uh, yeah, you find a lot of people as they come... You know, close to the end of their lives. Look what happened with the JFK thing. You know, it's just if enough time goes by, people become more comfortable releasing what they know. Yeah, well, that's why I said there, there's got to be other Bob Lazars out there, and there surely are. So, um, 
you, you take the very moral position that you would rather see them not come back for their own sakes than come back and, and verify your story. Oh, ab absolutely. <laughs> if you're listening, don't listen to Art. Don't say anything. <laughs> 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 West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Bob Lazar. Hello. Hello, uh, this is Bob in Beaverton listening to KEX. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to know, uh, Bob, have you ever heard of the work of Jerry Gallimore, who under certain conditions could see gravity? No, never heard that before. Okay, uh, the way he did it uh, was um, doing the old uh, high school uh, science class project, just lay a a bar magnet on a table and put the paper on it and sprinkle the iron filings on it so you can see the magnetic lines of force. Okay. But, but Jerry was a Native American and something of a shaman, and uh, around the center point of that magnet, he could see a halo of energy uh, that was gravity. Okay, and here is where the... Why the, does he think it was gravity? The metaphysical meets uh, science. Well, regardless, he, he thought that. So... Uh, do you ever wonder about that at all, Bob? I mean, the entire metaphysical world, uh, maybe it's all hooey, and maybe it's another one where you can say, prove it to me first, but, boy, I'll tell you, there's some good stories out there. I hear them all the time about things that we simply really don't understand regarding the afterlife. And I'm, I'm sure that that is true, you know, to, to, be, to be so bold to say that, boy, we have science handled and we pretty much know what's going on and everything's cut and dry and you know that is so far from the truth we you know we aren't even even at the tip of the iceberg as far as knowledge about everything around us and you know talk about the metaphysical stuff we really have no idea what's going on and a lot of these things that you know people think are silly you know, and the things that I I may laugh at may actually turn out to be true. Oh, yeah. So there's it's, going to be a place to keep an open mind. There's going to be a place, Bob, where the metaphysical or something in the metaphysical square on meets science, and science suddenly will say, "Oh my God, there is another side," or "Oh my God, uh, we really now suddenly have proof to some degree of a soul." Some way to prove something in the metaphysical who knows what it might turn out to be but somewhere science and the metaphysical will suddenly meet i predict it um first time caller line you're on the air with bob lazar hello hi this is ken in salt lake hey. and i'm just loving your program you guys are both wonderful oh, thank Thanks. you i have an observation and a question uh the observation is in encarta in microsoft encarta in the encyclopedia there's a reference about element 115 if you go into really? 1976, look under physics, 1976, it talks about element 115 as being present in a meteorite that came into the Earth's atmosphere. Oh, okay. And also the heavier elements. Wait, wait a minute, sir. Wait, 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 oh, wait. Oh, oh, oh. Where was this again? I'm In Encarta, uh, which is the, uh, I guess that's the, uh, what is it, the encyclopedia that you get for your computer from Microsoft. Really? And Microsoft and Carter, and you go to 1976, where under and physics... And they're talking about a, a meteor that had element 115 in it. 115, and they, they were able to measure it and deduce that it had element 115 in it. And also, uh, the other reference is for 116 through about 124, at the end of the article, it says they were uh, measured in mica schist that was in Africa. Wow. So in micro schist, uh, mica schist which is, I guess, a rock formation, there is, uh, there's trace when they bombard it with a, a Van de Graaff generator at high energy, gives off a, a pattern of, uh, of, of atomic, uh, some signature that shows that those elements were there. The logic is there, they talk about well, it. Well, wow, that's really interesting. Yes. I, now, this is an, isn't in Carta, it, we're not talking about something that's on the Internet. Yeah, we were talking about in Carta that you'd buy for your computer, which is a encyclopedia from Right, on a... It comes from Microsoft, right? Yeah, okay, well, it's a Microsoft software program. You just and and what did computer. you look up to find this? Under physics, 1976. All right, great. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of the article, it's in there, uh, the reference. Okay, the other question I have, the only question I have All right, is, stop for a second. Uh, okay. Out there, if somebody would be so kind as do the research, email it to me. I'll have it by tomorrow night. Continue, <laughs> sir. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. One other question. That is, I heard the rumor that somebody had tried to open one of the reactors somewhere 
on the facility there. Somebody made that suggestion and there was a atomic explosion underground. Do you know anything about that? Mm. Yeah, I heard that, and I oh. heard that officially, too. Oh, oh, oh really? Yeah, I, yeah, that was one of the things that was told to me. In fact, that was one of the reasons why I worked there, because I was allegedly replacing one of these people. So the previous Bob Lazar got a little too close to what was going on, apparently, and from from what I recall from the story, I believe it was in March, and I don't remember the date, yes. but it was it was uh, announced as a nuclear test, and there is a corresponding date for that test, and uh, what they have My listed gosh. as the test is completely false information. That was the detonation of the reactor at the test site. Um, in the detonation, so it exploded with the force of you say they announced it as a it was a low yield test a low you yield. know as they remember they used to do that in las vegas all oh, the time. Uh, sure i used to you announce know. it you know get off high buildings that kind of stuff right so. they, they'd always tell you in advance but uh anyway the, the that data is on their site not about what it was but that date and i don't remember it in march i'm sure george knapp or one of those guys that do you know anything about but. the nature of the um uh, the explosion the uh, yeah the, i know it was the, the intention was, well, the frustration was with the reactor at that point, and for whatever reason, somebody had the bright idea, well, let's try and open it, open it yeah. while it's operating. Oh, really? So, yeah. The oh, my. Extra smart guys working on this problem. So they took this, uh, <coughs> they they took the one of the prototype, not the prototype reactors, one of the reactors from one of the other craft, and by the way, they all looked exactly the same, not the craft, but the reactors, and they uh, took it to the nuclear test site, and it was done remotely underground. And the people monitoring it I, apparently were too close, and they didn't they didn't realize the explosion was you know going to be that large, and it did. And again, this isn't something I witnessed. This is something I was told, but it was something I was told while I was out at the site. So. It just has another notch of authenticity because I heard it out. How many uh, people allegedly lo lost their lives in this? Do you know? I don't. I don't recall. It wasn't. It, it wasn't like there were a lot of people. There were, you know, uh, two or three people from what seems to stick in my mind. But I, I can't say that for sure. I don't recall. Whew. I, 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 I did hear that exact story. I'll be doggone. I had ne never heard any of that. All right. All right. Uh, wild card line. You're on the air with Bob Lazar. Hello. Yes, uh, my name is Ben. I'm just outside of Boston. Okay. And uh, I've got a question going back to Bob's comments about running his car on hydrogen. Okay, fire away. Uh, okay. Um, over the last bunch of years, Nexus Magazine has run a, at least a couple of articles about running one's car on hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, using electrolysis, in other words, generating the hydrogen uh, on board, on demand. Um, and I just, some people I've spoken to about it say it's a ridiculous idea that it's impossible, that it would take... I'm one of those people. Really? More energy? It's not happening. You, you can't crack water that fast. Oh, it, oh really? Yeah, the, you, you can't. Because there's a guy... Unless, unless you're carrying a nuclear power plant behind you. <laughs> you, you. You just can't. Water doesn't come apart that fast. And, and uh, there are... Flash ways. In fact, uh, I met a physicist from Sandia Labs here and was talking to him, and they have uh, this neat device that kind of works on a, a plasma pulse and, and cracks water at much higher volume than electrolysis. And in fact, a guy emailed me, rec emailed me recently that has something that does that with uh, hydrocarbons. But uh, as far as you know, driving a car and having and producing hydrogen by electrolysis from water at a volume great enough to keep the car running is oh. never going to happen. It's not <laughs> so going to happen. Takes, so you, you, you are uh, required, really, to, to generate the hydrogen at some other time, some other place, and then pipe right. it into the car and store it. You can't our, our product is a small hydrogen generator, kind of like a uh, dishwasher. Uh, sits in your garage, solar panels, and it takes... Two to three days to fill the tanks because it it you it takes a lot of energy and it takes a long time to do it. Now there are faster ways, but you know they consume more power and well some don't, but are more complicated. Don't use water, so on and so forth. Ours is a low cost, just uses connects to the water line, uses solar panels, and slowly cranks out hydrogen. And you can 
over a period of two to three days, fill the tanks in your car, and then, you know, you can drive 700 miles. Ideally, you'd have several sets of tanks and just fill them and, and whatnot. But uh, that's, it's the only way to do it. I've been playing with hydrogen fuel systems since, you know, the, the late 70s. And uh, that you just can't make it fast enough. Huh. Caller, okay. a few seconds. Uh, well, I'm all set. You're happy? All right, then I bye. Guess. Thank, yep, thank, thank, you. thank you, and uh, take care. And I'm afraid that uh, time is slipping by. Uh, no, it has slipped by, and the end of the program is here. So, hey, Bob, man, what a great program. Again, every time you come on, it's a great program. Hey, always great to talk to you, Art. And uh, maybe next time you're here, I'll give you the uh, the Lear test. <laughs> anyway, anyway, listen, thanks for being here, huh? Hey, thank you. Thanks again, Art. Take care and good night.